we were talking about big data, artificial intelligence, and now machine learning. And um, even though we all, we're all aware that artificial intelligence is now part of our lives, as one of the, the last speakers said, it's not that intelligence yet. We're lucky for that. But uh, we do not realize that sometimes the behavior of these algorithms can be everything but ethical. We need to raise awareness on the necessary principles to build a fair and ethical AI-driven technology solutions. And to elaborate more on these elements, I'm thrilled to count with Nuri Oliver, Chief Data Scientist of Data Pop Alliance, and someone unique and extremely savvy on these topics. Well, you probably know Nuria, I'm sure she's with us, uh, but Nuri Oliver is co-founder and vice president of Ellis, co-founder uh, and scientific director of the Ellis Unit Alicante, chief scientist, scientific advisor to the Vodafone Institute, and she earned her PID in, in MIT. Nuria, how are you doing? Hi, good afternoon. It's a great pleasure to be here. Thank Happy you to see this. you again. Yeah, great, yeah. To, great to see you. Okay, so we, we, we have to make this session um, super effective because we've got like 14 minutes and um, we want to listen to you. I know you speak fast, but, um, <laughs> but we need to get into many good ideas. So the first, uh, and this is something that you, you pointed out sometimes, and I would like to, to check with you. You say normally that the country who leads the AI will lead the fourth industrial revolution. Uh, the question is, are we in a good position? I mean, Spain, Europe? Uh, no, we are not. <laughs> okay, thanks. <laughs> so Great. <in> short answer. <laughs> <laughs> so there is clearly two um, leading um, regions or countries right now in the world, North America on the one hand, and Asia, mainly China on the other hand, leading Europe in a dangerous, um, weak position of like an extreme dependency on these two superpowers, these two AI superpowers, on the use of AI in Europe. And this applies to research, innovation, and also the deployment and the use of AI in society. So we do need to react, and obviously um, European institutions know about this. And I think uh, at this point, we need to make sure that three key pillars are met. We need to have a vision, we need to have ambition, and we need to actually execute on that vision, you know, with ambition, if we want to be competitive in AI on a global scale. Okay, so vision, ambition, and execute. But my question is, um, the fact that we are not um, leading, uh, I wonder, I don't know, I know nothing about this, but um, I suppose that leading should imply having ethics on mind, and probably, if you don't have ethics on mind, you can run faster. If you have to, to regulate things, sometimes maybe it takes your, more time, or, or it's not because of that? I want to be nice with our people. No, oh, no, it's not, it's not uh, exclusively or necessarily because of the regulatory framework. A big part of it is because um, the, the, the big, uh, the unprecedented power and growth of a handful of technology companies, both North American and uh, Chinese technology companies. The leadership in research in artificial intelligence today is actually not even in academia. A lot of it is in the research labs of the big technology companies. Um, and because there are no big technology companies uh, in Europe, that's one of the key reasons why Europe is lagging behind North America and China. Okay, we're not leading, but um, just trying to, to be nicer with our people uh, who are not leading yet. Uh, I remember a, um, a statement from Stephen Hawking who said once that AI can be the best or the worst thing that happened to humanity. Um, it tends to sound as the worst, but why? Why do you think people feel it like it's something dangerous and, and not as beneficial as it could be sometimes? Yeah, I actually used that uh, quote in my presentations, uh, at the end of my presentation, mainly to say, you know, let's work together to make sure that AI is the best thing you know, that has happened to us. So like any other technology, um, it depends on how you use it, whether it would be you know, for good or it would be for evil. Um, I think partly the attribution that we make or the negative connotation that we have about AI in our society is also fueled by the science fiction movies that we watch or the novels, you know, science fiction novels that we read, where in most cases, the way um, artificial intelligence is depicted 
is not necessarily positive for humanity, right? But I think it's very important to understand that the big challenges that we face as a species, the climate change, you know, the climate emergency, the energy you know, crisis, pandemics, you know, the aging of the population, we're not going to be able to tackle these challenges without the help of AI. AI is not the solution, but it will definitely be part of the solution. So we do need to show this potential that artificial intelligence has to actually have social positive impact and to help us survive as a species. And that's what motivates my work. And that's, um, you know, one of the big messages that I want to um, share here. You know, there are endless opportunities in leveraging artificial intellect intelligence techniques and developing new artificial intelligence techniques to tackle pretty much the 17, you know, or the 16 uh, sustainable development goals. So um, let's just make sure, you know, and let's work together to make sure that we put AI to a good use, basically. Yeah, but you, you, you tend to say that every AI is everywhere and that's why we need to find a way to, to um, let's say, to find a way to use it for good. But um, how can you use it for good if the guys who code it sometimes, certain times, didn't do it that good? Um, how do you make it? How can you fight against that coders? Yeah, so I mean, I think like in any other sector, you know, we do need um, a regulation uh, on how the technology is being used. We have that for every sector from whatever the food we eat, you know, where we have safety regulations and all sorts of, you know, um, uh, health, you know, regulations to the appliances that we use, you know, that are not going to explode in our face, you know, when we turn on the microwave because they have complied, you know, with all the regulations. So we need to make sure that the technology that we use also has certain, you know, guarantees and provisions of respecting fundamental, you know, human rights and principles such as, you know, um, equity or non-discrimination, you know, uh, respecting uh, uh, individual and group privacy or, you know, preserving human autonomy. So uh, avoiding the subliminal manipulation of human behavior that we are probably all victims of, you know, <laughs> on a daily basis. Okay. And, and if, we, if we look at the... Um the way AI should be developed by those guys who code it and trying to make it in a good way. Um, do we need to think that um, they should be helping individuals the same way they can help big amounts of people? I mean, should they help all of them at the same time? Is this a, a thing of mass or it can help also individuals? Well, I mean, AI is fundamentally software, and software is scalable. So you can deploy, you know, the software relatively easily, you know, into hundreds uh, uh, of thousands and millions, and you know, thousands of millions, you know, of people. So it has this uh, power, you know, being extremely scalable. At the same time, using artificial intelligence techniques, we can personalize um, services and products, and, and have a better understanding of each of us individually, right, and adapt to each of us. So I think you can um, build systems that are, um, uh, that have sort of like, that are tuned to the individual characteristics of the different uh, people, but at the same time, you can deploy them massively, you know, mm -hmm. to yeah, uh, yeah. millions. No, I was thinking that because if, uh, we, we talked in the previous session about the ADMS, the automated decision making systems, which can affect personally to one individual, or it can help um, a big amount of people. But at the same time, I was thinking on what you run through Ellis and what you did uh, through AI and uh, related to the pandemic, as you were pointing yeah. out. Now, I would love for you to explain us how you faced um, or how you used technology in favor of the people in the COVID. Yeah, so the main um, um, purpose of that uh, project was to um, close the gap that there is between where the data is, if we think that data is a digital representation of an underlying reality, and where the decision makers are, the people that are actually making decisions that impact all of us. And what we would like is that for those decisions to be informed by evidence, to be based on some underlying reality. So what we need is to be able to fill the gap between where the data is and where the decision makers are. And to do that in the context of the pandemic, I have been leading a team of 25 more or less scientists from the Valencian uh, research ecosystem 
And we have been working very closely with the presidency of the Valencian government here in the Valencian region and working on three or four main areas, modeling large scale human mobility from um, publicly available aggregated um, mobile data, um, because of course, um, an infectious disease that is transmitted from human to human, like COVID, like uh, coronavirus, uh, doesn't become a pandemic if we don't move. And that's why we have been confined you know, for so many months. So modeling mobility is very important. The second piece of uh, work um, has been on building computational epidemiological models, models that would enable us to predict how the pandemic curve is going to evolve, not only under the current scenario, but also under different possible interventions. You know, what would happen if we close schools? What would happen if we don't allow travel? What would happen if we don't allow you know, uh, uh, gatherings and so forth? Mm -hmm. The third area is building predictive models uh, to predict hospital occupancy, intensive care occupancy, and also to infer the prevalence of the disease. And the fourth area is a very large citizen survey that we launched in March of 2020 called COVID-19 Impact Survey, and it's become one of the biggest in the world. It has uh, over 700,000 answers right now, and it has enabled us week after week to understand what is the situation and the perception of people throughout the pandemic. As far as the I know. work has not only had impact like here in Spain, but also internationally. So we were the world winners of the XPRIZE Pandemic Response Challenge with our computational epidemiological models and also um, a system to recommend interventions to decision makers. And we've also won Best Paper Award in a, um, a machine learning sort of like international mm -hmm. conference. So it's been nice to be able to help locally but also have impact globally. That, that, that's exactly what I was going to say, that as far as I know, um, you were um, doing even forecasts in 180 days, I think, um, uh, before it, anything happened in 236 countries. And I, I suppose you still track what's going on with the pandemic, of course, this is not over. Um, but you are probably now tracking what's going on in Europe, what's happening in the world, what's happening in Spain. Um, any idea you can give us in 30 seconds to know a bit what's going to come? Well, I mean, as we see in Northern Europe, you know, in Germany, in the Netherlands, the cases are, are, are increasing. Uh, as we uh, reopen our societies and we, um, you know, um, so socialize more, you know, with uh, less and less of like protection, you know, measures, the virus is still around, the virus is still here. So the virus is going to be circulating. And the key is how protected we are not to get really sick, you know, when we when we get coronavirus. And that's why the vaccines play such, a, such an important role to protect each of us uh, from getting, you know, a very serious case of the disease. One of the biggest questions, and I guess the empirical data, most clear empirical data was from Israel, was uh, how does the efficacy of the vaccine decline over time, right? In, in Israel, they had to do the third dose for the Pfizer vaccine because, you know, it had been uh, six months since the first dose, since the first two doses, since the last of the second dose, and then it seemed that it was losing some of the efficacy in preventing serious, you know, complications from getting the virus. So I think that's one of the, um, um, the, the areas to be very observant about, you know, how the, um, the efficacy of the vaccines, you know, might be evolving in the next weeks or couple of months because um, even though there might be a lot of cases, if those cases don't translate into hospitalizations or you know deaths, um, and it might be acceptable, you know, from a, a social perspective. The, the, the challenge is when um, you know getting the disease means serious health complications and mm. potentially even death. That's where you know we do have a problem, obviously. Yeah. Definitely. We've got one minute left. Um, I'm going to extend one more minute, I suppose. Sonia George is not going to be angry with me. But uh, the, the question here is, um, I wanted to go to, to, I'm going to do two questions. I mean, I've got plenty, but I'm going to go to, on two of them. First one, uh, connected with AI and machine learning and, and bias, and, and, and having in mind that um, many of those algorithms were coded 
basically by men. We were saying at the beginning of the sessions, and there was a, a study. I think it was from AI Now. Um, I think it was run by University of New York, but I'm not. I'm not very sure. But anyway, the, the information which was interesting was that I think it was a 10 percent, in between 10 and 15 percent of the people who were coding in Google and Facebook and both uh, were women, and the rest were men. Um, how are we talking about? Anything if we don't, I mean, if don't if we don't make it properly. I mean, it's it's kind of stupid to be talking about um, all those algorithms that you say they are everywhere. Okay, but who is coding them? And it's that bros man and all that thing. So how can we fix that? Yeah, well, it's a very <laughs> difficult question to answer in thirty seconds. Um, indeed, the lack of diversity in the computing field in general and specifically in AI is uh, is um, very worrisome. Um, there are roughly between 12% and 15% of female students in computer science in Spain, for example, and that figure has been going down since the 1980s. There were more women in computer science in the 1980s than there is right now, even though technology is everywhere and there are so many opportunities for the people that, you know, that know about technology. So it's absolutely critical that we as a society inspire the next generations of like girls and teenage, female teenagers, you know, um, to, to study this field. Because we do know that any field that lacks diversity, it is um, a field that, that is not realizing its full potential. There is a loss only in Europe of billions every year because of not having enough women in technology. And we also do know that the solutions built by teams that are not diverse are less inclusive and less innovative that the solutions and, and the ideas generated by diverse teams. So we do need it as a society, and I think it is our duty to really, again, implement actions with ambition to uh, try to revert this situation, which is, you know, really worrisome, and is due to a variety of factors, from stereotypes into, you know, who is a, a programmer, you know, who works in computer science and how the discipline is being taught to a lack of role models and a lack of visibility of women working in technology to um, really sexist and mis misogynist culture in many technology circles called the programmer culture to what is called um, uh, uh, gender biases that we all have and that make us undervalue women systematically. And when I, when I say we all, I mean we all. So we women yeah. tend to underestimate ourselves and also other women yeah. and then men too. Clearly. Um, you see, the good thing of asking is that you don't have to respond in 30 seconds, so difficult things. Um, now, 10 seconds. Uh, last one, I need to ask you about this because I read it from you and I think it's really key. You advise so many administrations about how to manage ethically and address these things of algorithms, um, but I, I wonder about following generations. Should they have some new skills or learnings at school to kind of um, understand better how to address this? And we finish with this in 20 seconds. Yes, I think we need to change what we teach and how we teach. I think on the what, we should include a transversal subject of computational thinking. And also on the, on the how we teach and on the kind of like soft skills that we teach, I think we should reinforce a lot more creativity, critical thinking, and abilities from our social and emotional intelligences that are key to us as a species to survive, and that maybe we are even losing because we are not exercising them enough. Great. Nuri Oliver, it was great uh, listening to you, learning from you. Uh, next time, I hope we can meet you here physically. Uh, thank you very much. It's a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. Pleasure having mine.